A television news anchor offers her perspective on the demands of the 24-7 news cycle. You, you stop what you're doing to hear what, what a broadcaster is saying. I mean, that's really powerful. Then, we'll talk with a local blogger about the rise of online and social media. You can jump in and share your opinion. I think that's not just here to say. I think we're going to see some really interesting tools being developed soon. But first, a journalism professor and a newspaper editor shares how he's adapting his lessons to align with the changing nature of news. The way people have, are getting their news and accessing their news has, has changed drastically since the time I was in journalism school. We'll talk with three Central Floridians about the media industry and the role the news plays in our region, next on Metro Center Outlook. Hello, I'm Diane Trees. The practice of gathering and sharing news is as old as time, but the way in which we take it in has changed drastically. Today, we'll talk about the evolution of the news industry and the changing nature of media. Rick Brunson, a journalism professor at UCF, joins me first to talk about how he's preparing the next generation of journalists. Rick, welcome to the show. Thank you, Diane. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. How has the industry changed since you got your start? Well, today, 24% uh, of Americans got their news from a, a print newspaper. 47% got news yesterday from their social media application on their smartphone or on their tablet. So the way people have are getting their news and accessing their news has, has changed drastically since the time I was in journalism school. So you're saying that most people get their news from some social media source? Well, still, most people get their news, 55% of Americans get their news from television, still. Television's still the dominant uh, okay. form. But beyond that, or second to that, social media platforms like Facebook, uh, people are, are going there first to, uh, to get news. Um, and then people are still reading the print newspaper, but uh, fewer of them today. What about the substance in newspapers today? Ha has it changed? How has it changed? Well, the thing about print journalism and, and why I think it won't completely go away is because what print journalists do, what newspaper reporters do every day in going to City Hall and going to the school board, in you know going to the water commission meetings, being a watchdog and keeping tabs on what government is doing with the power and the tax money that that they they get from citizens you still need people every day watching the levers of government and by and large it's newspaper reporters who do that so the function of print journalism is still very very important it's just the way that people are accessing the news uh, and, and reading what print journalists do has, has changed so the way we, we get the news and, and read the news and access it has changed. We interact with it more, uh, which is different from the time that, that I was a journalism student. It was all a one-way conversation. Now we're much more interactive with the news. You can contact the reporter about the story that you've read. Uh, you can contact that anchor via Twitter and interact with him or her. So the news is much more interactive. It's much more about sharing. And uh, I think that has uh, been good for democracy. Well, with S the, the news is criticized today. Are people still interested in, in hearing and getting the news? Oh, absolutely. People are accessing news and, and interacting and spending more time with the news than ever before. The, pre the, the Pew Research Center, um, which constantly tracks news consumption in this country, uh, their most recent data and, and, and study of news consu consumption shows that people are spending on average across all age groups about 70 minutes a day with news which is up over 10 years ago so the plethora of new devices tablets smartphones um, really that means we're spending more time with the news than ever before there's the whole you know phenomena of two screening and three screening where when news breaks there's uh, you know, you know uh, the assassination of, of bin Laden or you know, a typhoon in the Philippines, 
people flip on CNN, but they also flip open their laptop or crack open their iPad, and they're, they're consuming and grazing across multimedia platforms, getting as much news as they can, and interacting with it, sharing it with friends across Facebook and Twitter. So Americans are as, as big of news consumers as they've ever been, and because they have more devices and ways right. in which to access and, and interact with And them. I know that for myself. I, I'm much more plugged into things. How are you changing the way you teach journalism reporting with the onset of, of news instantly? Some basics in the curriculum are never going to change. News writing, writing that is compelling, that is concise, that is conversational, that is relevant to people. That is still important. Text is still important to the way people consume news. Uh, a journalist's legal and ethical responsibilities are still important. So we still teach mass communication law, but we're also teaching twibble law because you can libel someone and defame someone with a tweet as easily as you can in a good old-fashioned print newspaper. So ethics, legal responsibilities, news writing, those parts of the curriculum are still solid in the core of what we teach our students. But because here at UCF the journalism program is small, it also means that we can be nimble and react quickly. So for example, in this year, 2014, one of my colleagues, Dr. Kim Voss, is rolling out a brand new course on writing for social media because you write differently for social media platforms than you do longer form platforms such as magazines and newspapers. Um, I'm also teaching a course now that I would have never envisioned 10 years ago, and that's mobile reporting. So in my mobile reporting class, my students uh, learn to create complete story packages, text, video, photo galleries, completely with their smartphones. So That must be a great deal of fun. It's a great deal of fun. It's a blast. It's like playing in a sandbox because there's like 300,000 apps out there now, and we're constantly in my class learning what new app to edit video better with. So, Well, what, what excites you most about where you see journalism heading now? The excitement that I get is from seeing in the eyes of my students who are entering the field the possibilities. It's, it, you know, let's not make a mistake. It's been a, a tremendous chaotic time and, and time of turmoil in media in the last 10 years with the rise of new digital technologies and, and, and how they have subsumed older and traditional media. But for my students who are digital natives and going into a field, I see excitement in their eyes and I see possibility and potential in their eyes because they're able to tell compelling stories in new ways. They can tell it with video, they can tell it with a blog, they can tell it with photo. and and. So they're reaching more people. The, 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 the possibility for them to take a story that they're working on and reach an exponentially huge audience when something goes viral is exciting to them. And it's exciting to me as their teacher and their coach and their mentor. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. When we come back, we'll learn how the Internet is impacting TV news. Yvette Brazal is an anchor for News 13 Orlando, who is active in journalism and local communities. Beth, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Go Knights! <laughs> what topics matter most to local news TV stations? It de really depends, I think, whether it's ratings or not, um, because I really think that drives so many TV stations. But I'm going to be honest with you. I can only speak for us, and I work for News 13. Um, we're the only 24-hour news channel here in town covering all of Central Florida from the East Coast all the way up the West Coast to Tampa and beyond. Um, what drives us is really the flexibility to be able to just go with anything that we think is n newsworthy and just stay with it. So if there's a huge, you know, backup on I-4, everybody's affected that in the morning. So another station may lead with, like, the blood and the gore. And we go, you know what, we have to look at the big picture because we're on 24 hours. The other folks have to dump out to go to a soap opera, to go to some game show. Our bread and butter 
is doing the news. So it's pertinent to what's going on right now. It's in pertinent Central to Florida. what's going on right now, and we have, you know, we, we're, we're 24 hours. So basically, it just depends on what the, um, the, you know, if it's going back to school, then traffic's going to be a big deal. Weather's always a big deal. We do it every 10 minutes. So it kind of just depends, uh, you know, what the flow of the situation of the day is. For TV news, how important is it to develop a rapport with viewers? I mean, you're doing the news, so do you need that kind of rapport? Yeah, I think so. You know, I th I'm a TV news junkie. Uh, I'll just, you know, self-admit it. Um, guilty as charged. I've loved news since I was a very, since I was a child. My grandmother would read the newspaper in Puerto Rico called uh, El Mundo. It's now gone, but, uh, and I would say, you know, what, what's she doing? She's reading all of this thing, all this newspaper. Um, it, it just becomes kind of part of the fabric of who you are. And so you come into people's homes, they're running around in their, you know, undergarments, getting ready for work, <laughs> getting ready for school. It, you're in their house. So yeah, whenever we have an event that we have to go to and we wear our, our News 13 shirts and we have to go say hello, you know, it's nice to be able to see who's on the other side of the camera because they see me, but I don't see them. So you got to have that connection, definitely, for sure. Do you think viewers still have that loyalty for news anchors and reporters the way they used to? You know what? I, 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 would, I would like to say that that would be the case. Um, the way that it was back in the day when I grew up just up the road in uh, Union Park in East Orange County, uh, people used to go barefoot to the TGNY. We've come a long way. But back in those days, um, yeah, you, you know, your family watched a channel. You kind of grew up with that network, and that's what you did. Uh, these days, I think there's so much competition. There's so many channels to watch. Who do you connect with? I think um, as a broadcaster, as a journalist, uh, you know, if you let your hair down, just be yourself. The same way that you are if you see a viewer at the hallway at, you know, Walmart or at the fairgrounds or at the mall, just just do that at work, you know, use those words to just kind of engage people. It doesn't always have to be, you know, anchorman talk like that movie. <laughs> just, you know, let your hair down. Well, how has social media impacted what huge. you do for the news? Huge, huge, because before people had to wait till 5, people had to wait till 6, people had to wait till 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., but now it's instant. And what's really cool, I love this, is that before, if somebody is trying to scramble to find a crew to go somewhere, well, guess what? Uh, the person that joins us on Twitter or on Facebook is they're kind of like our eyes and ears. So if they're out there, they snap the picture of the crash on I-4, send it into us. You know, we'll use your name. We'll, we'll we'll get that story on faster. So I think it's really completely changed the landscape of news for sure. How much then do you collaborate with other news sources like print news or bloggers? Um, it depends. We have um, you know a pretty fluid situation when it comes to our our web producing team. Um, and so they have lots of folks that they work with, but um, yeah, we have great relationships with various bloggers. You know, some bloggers are kind of questionable. I think we all have, you know, met some of those folks, uh, but many of them um, have a, they're, they're on, standing on solid ground. They have the best intentions. They're legit and they get uh, good information and we'll, we, you know, we'll mention them, we'll use them. Uh, video sometimes they provide for us. So yeah, we'll definitely try to use them as much as we can, but. We, we see the news changing. How are you seeing, what kinds of changes for, for TV news? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, I say that with much, I have to carefully craft what I want to say because it's in my heart. I love it. I, I'm in love with being a journalist. I've always wanted to be that since I was a little girl. I don't know what else to do. One day, I'm sure I'll have to figure it out if I ever stop doing this. But um, it, it's, you know, it's an evolving thing. I think a lot of folks um, need to realize that when a news story is breaking, uh, they're not going to, oh, we'll just DVR and watch it later. It, they're going to run to their TV, whether they're in their lunch break, whether they're at home, whether they're at work or the doctor's office. You run to the TV. You, you stop what you're doing to hear what, what a broadcaster is saying. I mean, that's really powerful. That's very, very powerful. And I hope that it doesn't um, change as the years progress. You're very passionate about what you do. What do you like most about your job? Um, I love coming in at 2 in the morning. <laughs> that's my favorite part. Uh, we come in at 2, 2.30, 2 2.15. Uh, we go live at 5. The, you know, my favorite part is that rush of everyone running because something big is breaking, whether it's good or whether it's not so good, meaning there's a tragic story unfolding, or somebody big is coming to town, we're gonna take this event live. 
Um, and that to me, just that rush of being able to not just get it first, because sometimes people rush to get it first, they get it wrong, but just to be able to bring that to people who are watching it um, you know, on TV, wherever they are, or on their, on their phone or on their laptop, uh, and that's the biggest rush for me, just to bring something live as it's happening in the moment. What advice do you have for someone, a young person, that wants to have broadcasting as a career? Um, I'm not going to say what a lot of folks that I know in the business usually would want to say to the bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, don't, don't do it. You know, the hours are long. The pay, uh, some would say, is mm -mm -mm. I can't complain. You know, I've been at the station where I am for about almost 16 years. Um, it, it is very, it's fluid, it's changing. The one advice that I would have to say, besides the long hours and the pay, mm, at the very beginning is be able to be tech savvy. Multi-platform news uh, is the way to be right now. And if you don't know how to shoot your own video, edit your own video, put it on you know the social media out, uh, you know put it out that way, uh, you got nothing going on. So if you're not open to that, forget it. Just just stay home. Ebeth, thank you so much for spending the time pleasure. here. After the break, we'll talk with a local blogger who is sharing and capitalizing on her personal stories. Katie Widrick is the blogger behind Healthy Living in a Hectic World, an avenue for her to share tips about food, fitness, family, and more. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. How did you get your start in blogging? That's a great question. I uh, have a traditional media background. I studied broadcast journalism in college and came out and became a television producer and really thought traditional journalism was going to be my path. And I ended up leaving uh, at least the television news world in, in 2007, but still felt like I wanted an outlet to share some of my opinions. And so, like so many people, I Googled how to start a blog and you know figured out how to, to jump in with a free site. And what's been interesting since I launched in 2007 Seven is the shift in, in what I've done. I started out by doing a little bit more uh, sort of daily news commentary, talking about headlines and, and my opinion on it. And then as my life changed, I really kind of changed the focus of my blog. And as you mentioned, I really, now my focus is about my journey through fitness and healthy living and, and you know, what my experience has been. But it's, as blogging has changed, I think I have changed and it's been a real adventure since I started. So your blog has evolved along with your life. Talk a little bit about your blog. It's such a comprehensive site. Well, thank you. It's a you know healthy living in a hectic world to me really sums up my approach. I, I'm a working mother. I have a full-time plus job. I'm very socially active. I train for triathlons, and so you know my blog has been a place to, for my own benefit, really document. Um, the highs and the lows of that life. You know, I, I share everything from my best race and talk about how great I felt crossing the finish line to the days when, say, training was difficult or when it was, it's a challenge to balance working motherhood. So it's it's a little bit of a, of a life casting site for me where I share, you know, my day-to-day -day activities. But what I have really come to appreciate is my ability to inspire others to, whether it's start uh, you know, their own healthy living journey or to try new social media tools. Um, my site has really evolved into becoming kind of an umbrella for everything that interests me. Right now, it's primarily healthy living and, and really finding the best tools through social media to make all of the things that we do a little bit more fun and easier. Well, who is your audience and how important <laughs> is it to determine that when you have a blog? That's a wow, that's a great question because I think it is important to understand how to measure it, to understand what tools are out there to see where people are coming, really what they're interested in. Um, but you know, once I figure that out, I, I put a lot of that aside because I think if you don't blog in your own voice and you don't share what you're truly passionate about, if you start worrying about making your your audience happy, you know, there's that saying that you, you try and please everyone, you please no one. So I think it's really important to understand that you can measure that, that maybe you can tailor some of your work to, to inspire people on a certain topic. But then, you know, you have to enjoy it. You have to blog about something that you're truly passionate about. And, and it's sort of, you know, it's, again, to use a, a phrase, if you blog about it, they'll come. Well, what about the social media aspect? Mm -hmm. can you have a successful blog without engaging readers from Facebook, Twitter? Mm -hmm. 
Can you? I, I, absolutely. You know, I, I think good content is good content. And especially as blogging becomes more niche driven, you know, no longer is it really enough to be a triathlete. You have to be a triathlete who follows a gluten free diet, who's a working mom, who, you know, whose name starts with an A. And, and I think that's good because readers and audiences are, are becoming more interested in finding people that are just like them. Um, so I think you certainly can be successful, but I think. I don't think you need to to try and work so hard. You know, the tools with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all of these other microblogging sharing sites, they really let you share your content in in ways that expose you to people that maybe don't know how to, to come to your blog. So it sounds like more of a natural kind of process for you. Well, talk about that process. How do you conceptualize a blog post? Well, I, uh, again, I think it speaks a little bit to my traditional journalism background, um, and I am a type A planner for sure. <laughs> I have an editorial calendar, and, and that sometimes it's everything from an actual calendar where I write ideas down or, you know, with uh, if there's a holiday coming up or if there's a time of year that I think I can lend some expertise to, you know, I'll make sure to start thinking about that. And I also have some electronic tools that do that. But, but really for me, I feel like if I'm struggling with something or if something's challenging me, then I think someone in my audience is as well. So so, you know, for me, uh, you know, I'm a vegetarian and I train for triathlon. And so it is always an interesting challenge for me to make sure that I'm fueling properly, that I'm staying healthy. And so I feel like if I can figure out how that works in my life and share that resource, then that's to me a good post. Um, and I think the more emotional and the more uh, you know honest you are with your readers about the challenges and overcoming obstacles, the, the stronger mm -hmm. and, and the more that, that post is gonna resonate. Blogging is not your full-time job. No. What advice would you have, though, for someone who wants to launch a blog as mm -hmm. a paid career? Well, a first advice is do like me and find a boss that, that supports you completely. And, you know, I think the nice thing about my work, I work for Growing Boulder, which is a, a television production company, and we have built online communities. And I think the best thing about my experience is that my boss understands that what I learn on my personal blog, the tools that I test out and the experiences that I have I, make me better at my full-time job. And I I'm able to bring that expertise to to my job. So, you know, if you're lucky like me, you'll you'll have a, a, a boss that invests in in your personal life as well. Um, but you know, I think just understanding that um, whether it's something that's so different than your full time job that it sort of lets you have your passion over there and it lets you express yourself in ways that maybe your full time job doesn't. I think that's a success. Or if it's something that can run side by side as it does in, in my job. Um, you know, just being able to kind of express yourself here and bring it back. I think when you're able to have an honest discourse with your readers when you're able to to tell your story then that makes you more passionate about everything else you do well you're obviously passionate i am <laughs> katie do you think blogging is here to stay I think blogging in some form or fashion is absolutely here to stay. You know, I think what has been interesting, as I said, I launched my blog in 2007 and blogging, long form blogging was so cutting edge. Now we have all these micro blogs like Instagram and Twitter and, and even Facebook to a point. So I think how we define blogging will certainly thought, continue to shift. Right, um, but, right. but the idea of sharing your, your personal story, the idea of having an opinion, the idea of having a very low barrier to entry so you don't have to be a traditional journalist, you don't have to have credentials, you can jump in and share your opinion. I think that's not just here to say. I think we're going to see some really interesting tools being developed soon. Katie, thanks for being here Thank today. You. That's all for our show today. Visit WUCFTV.org slash metro for interactive features, special content, and more. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, I'm Diane Trees.